What is the purpose of innovation? There's a huge trend in the world right now. The market is way more competitive than ever. Why do we need digital transformation in healthcare? Does it really benefit stakeholders? How has the healthcare business changed from the start of COVID-19? Hi, my name is Xu Zhenquan. I'm an emergency physician. Additionally, I'm very interested in digital health. I've tried to start a company doing telehealth service. Then I spent a year in Silicon Valley studying artificial intelligence application in healthcare and the healthcare system in the United States. So today I will talk about the digital health and how to do digital transformation in healthcare. Hi, my name is Xu Zhenquan. I'm an emergency physician. Today I will talk about digital transformation. This is the outline of my sharing today. I'll try to define what is digital health and go through Taiwan healthcare system roughly to answer some questions. Why do we need digital transformation in healthcare? Does it really benefit stakeholders? And next, I'll introduce some examples of digital transformations in healthcare. Finally, I'll share my thought about the problems of ongoing digital transformation. What is digital health? This concept is created by Professor Eric Topol, who is a cardiologist. He wrote a book in 2012 called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. In that book, he described the concept of digital human. He constructed the concept that every data from human bodies can be transformed into binary data, which can be processed or calculated by co computers. So we could use those binary data to improve healthcare more efficiently. WHO also pays attention to digital health. They focus on using technology to improve global health. There are many other definitions of digital health, but I think when people talk about digital health, the simplest and broadly used way to describe digital health is by using technology to perform or facilitate healthcare. Here comes another question. Why do we need digital transformation? In other words, does it benefit the stakeholders? Before answering the question directly, I would like to introduce the Taiwan healthcare system in a simplified way. We started from the center, individual or patient. Individual pays their premium or insurance fee to insurance company. In Taiwan, the biggest and dominant healthcare insurance institute is the government. We have national health insurance. The government will give that money to different hospitals. So the hospital could use that money to pay healthcare providers salaries or buy medications or medical devices from pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies. And finally, patients can get their treatments from hospitals or healthcare providers. In that system, different stakeholders have different desires. As a patient or individuals, we all want early diagnosis, prevention even better. Every patient wants to pay, pay less but have better outcome. It's humanity. The insurance company or government want to lower their reimbursement payment, and they hate to pay fraud reimbursement applications. The hospital want to pay less salary to healthcare providers or use other ways to get more profit. Healthcare providers want their workload could be decreased, workflow could be smooth. They want to understand or approach their patients easier and help the patients get better outcome. The pharmaceutical company or, bio or biotech company wants to accelerate drug discovery path and conduct clinical trials more efficiently. Those unmet needs are crucial for digital transformation development. Let's look back to the healthcare system. In fact, the healthcare system is a huge data generator. Every stakeholder generates a lot of data by themselves or by interactions with other stakeholders. Individuals could use physical trackers to record their physical activity or physical information such as heart rate, blood pressure, or body weight. Home monitors could record living environment information such as air quality. With those reimbursement payment records, the government actually has comprehensive epidemiological data and economic data. 
hospital store electronic health record, something like a laboratory examination result on, or images such as x-ray, MRI. Healthcare providers record digitally about what they did and how they treat the patient. Pharmaceutical company and biotech company have many research data and market data. So I think the digital transformation is essentially about how to get better data utilization and optimize such as payment flow, medications, delivery, etc. Through those transformation, we could fulfill stakeholders' desires. Let's look at some examples of digital transformation in healthcare. Apple Watch is an iconic example of digital health transformation. We could use Apple Watch to detect arrhythmia or monitor oxygen saturation. It is really helpful, especially the happy hypoxia is a warning sign during the early time of COVID. Apple Heart Study is a large scale study conducted by Stanford. And this example gave us an inspiration of a new direction of research. Dexcom is the leading brand of continuous glucose monitor. By using this wearable device, you could get your blood sugar level every five minutes so that you can adjust your diet accordingly or avoid extremely high or low blood sugar situations. Manage your diabetes without finger, finger sticks. This is their slogan. And I believe that would be the future of diabetes management because many studies show glucose fluctuation may be more harmful than stable mild high blood sugar. That could be only achieved by continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, electronic health record is the earliest digital transformation in healthcare. In the last century, most medical records were written on paper, which makes them hard to store and hard to use. So the electronic health record developed for decades, there are some problems of it. We'll talk about that later. Artificial intelligence is an unskippable topic when you talk about digital transformation. So what is artificial intelligence? It's a powerful method that could find the pattern from data and then answer your question. In healthcare, the most widely used technique is called convolutional neural network. It's usually to do image classification. By constructing a proper model and training the model with abundant data with pairing answers, the model could learn the pattern of pictures and use it to tell you what is inside the picture. For example, is it at a bird or cat or something else? AI is widely used in pathology now, and the performance is amazing. Pathology reading is a labor-intense work. Pathologists have to review a million of cells and find the abnormal ones. AI did a great job in, on, that, on this task. It could be more accurate than humans, faster than humans, even get some information that could not be recognized by humans' eyeballs. For example, the AI could find the genotype mutation without special immunostaining. In Taiwan, there's an outstanding AI company called Ether AI. They focus on digital pathology, and the performance of their model is better than one of the biggest digital pathology companies in the United States. You can see the ground truth of cancer cells, and this is the Ether AI's model performance. It's more accurate than the other one. Telehealth is one of the most flourishing applications of digital health during the pandemic. Telehealth is a way that you can approach your doctors and get an evaluation without meeting the doctors in person. You can see an amazing increased percentage of telehealth use. Visits to behavioral health specialists had the largest increase in telehealth use during the pandemic. With 38.1% of all visits to these providers delivered by telehealth, compared with only 1% in 2019. Uh, finally, I'll talk about the problems 
or you could say the opportunities of digital transformation. These three fields are important to digital transformation development, but somehow most people didn't pay attention to them in Taiwan. Hospital information system has is the backbone of hospitals. Without it, the doctor couldn't prescribe medications and the nurse couldn't arrange examinations for patients. However, most of the health has terrible user interface. Like this, there are many different fun functions and they are all hidden in this infinite multi-level nested menu. It's not a user-friendly design. Additionally, the system is unstable. It crashes all the time. I think the problem is there's no company focused on developing hospital information system in Taiwan. Most of the hospitals hire their own IT team to build out their heads. And the leader in hospitals didn't take it seriously. They only use limited budget for hiring people to build and maintain his. Health record digitalization began about 20 years ago. However, most hospitals only store health records. The utilization of EHR has not been fully developed. For example, if the patient wants to go to a different hospital, they must carry the paper health record and give it to the doctors in another hospital. There is also some room for improvement in telehealth. Now in Taiwan, you have to download three different apps before you start telehealth. One for the appointment, one for a virtual visit, and one for payment. The user experience is fragmented. This is the picture of telehealth in Taiwan. Though the percentage of using telehealth is increased in Taiwan, most hospitals still take it as a temporary substitute for in-person visit. And they are not valuing it as a potential trend or a destructive new way of patient care. To sum up, on the way to digital transformation, remember to satisfy stakeholders on many needs. The de development of AI may be a little bit slowed down now, but it won't be absent in the future. User interface and user experience are ex extremely underestimated in Taiwan. That could be an opportunity. Telehealth will keep growing even the pandemic is over. Thank you for your attention. Elder Care Asia's claim in 2022 is happy life, regardless of age. To introduce this new elder-friendly life idea in a tangible way, ECA will be divided into five main areas, lifestyle, smart care, innovation, health improvement, and residence. A series of events that synergize technology with topics such as smart care, precision medicine, smart monitoring, etc. will be hosted during the show. ECA 2022 will be giving end users and solution providers the opportunity to exchange ideas and explore cooperation with encounters around a variety of topics and side events to take place in the exhibition hall. ECA is the one and only platform for ages in the 50 plus bracket in Taiwan. Join us now. Hi, I'm Porsche, co-founder and CEO of Okmega. We develop social CRM for businesses to build trusted relationships with VIP customers with real-time first-party data. Hi, my name is Porsche. I'm the co-founder of Okmega. We develop social CRM for pharma companies to create touch points digitally and win deals efficiently. There's a huge trend in the world right now. First one is government lowered RX prices. No matter if it's Trump administry or Japan government or Taiwan government, all the governments are lowering the drug price significantly. And the, compet the market is way more competitive than ever. And we see more and more RX are falling off patent, which means more competitors are in the market and if you are facing biosimilar competition, the, price, the drug price drops 16% after your patent is off. 
So as a result, farmer's profitability is really limited. If farmer can't make profit, then all the farmers have to cut their sales force, which means the touch points, the relationships with HCPs will be decreased, and which means the HCP can't get the medical information they need to help them make a better uh, prescription, and which means the patient cannot access to better drug solutions. And due to, the, due to this huge trend, uh, pharma companies and medical device companies, they're looking for digital transformation to improve, to increase their margin. So they are looking at solutions like CRM to do digital transformation, to bring all the data online and make a better online strategy. However, the CRM, the current CRMs, they are built, the, the concept is built in the past 20 years. They're built in the past 20 years. So most of the communication tools are one-way communication, like email, SMS, which we all know that the open rate is slow. The, en the engagement rate is slow, which means even though we are trying to bring the touch points from offline to online, but nothing actually really happens. So as a result, pharma's profitability is limited. If pharma can't generate enough profit, they have to cut their sales force. They have to make their team leaner. And that's why a uh, lot of pharma are uh, right now they're laying off, no matter if it's Taiwan or internationally. And if there are no sales force, then the HCPs cannot get enough medical information for them to make the right judges. And not even mentioning that COVID is preventing people, the salespeople, to meet their doctors at, their, uh, at hospitals or clinics. And if the doctors are not able to know the product well enough, then which means patients cannot access to better drug. So the whole trend is hurting all the parties, no matter if the medical device, pharma companies, healthcare professionals, and even patients. So uh, pharma companies, they're looking for solutions to solve these, to solve these problems. They want to uh, implement, they want to integrate CRM into their process to build a new digital, um, do new digital platform for them to engage with uh, healthcare professionals. However, the, the current uh, CRMs we are looking at right now are built from 20 years ago, which means they're old, they're not interactive, they're not flexible. The communication tools they're using are email and SMS, which we all know that the open rate is slow, the engagement rate is slow. So what we see right now is even though pharma companies, they spend lots of money and time into digital transformation projects, but the CRM is built, but no data ex is actually coming in. So this is why Oak Mega developed Social CRM. We want to help pharma companies to build uh, relationships on social platforms and build interactive relationships to bond with HCPs better, to help HCPs know your product better, to help the patients get the right medicine they need. Okmega wants to help pharma companies to create touch points digitally and win deals efficiently. This is how we do it. We want to help your salespeople, your marketing and your medical people to able to acquire, engage, retain, and grow your VIP customers in one platform. So I'm going to break down into four parts. The first one is user acquisition. You need to know who's healthcare professionals precisely, especially in markets like Taiwan. So we provide identity authentication process. So for a user, uh, no matter if they're coming to your line, Telegram or browser websites, we're able to identify them automatically and letting you know who they are, where they're from, and what they're up for, and even who's their sales rep. So after they join into your member uh, membership program, your line official account, and all these platforms, different people can access to different content and um, get what they need, basically. And second, after we are able to identify 
uh, your your users, the one the your clients that you want to talk to. Then we provide lots of engagement solutions for you to build relationships with them. For example, if you're a marketer, you're able to send the right content to the right people with uh, just a few uh, just a few clicks. And you're not only doing one-way communication anymore. You have personalized chatbot for you to have to to engage with them to build to build deeper relationships automatically and we also provide over 20 modules on demand modules for marketers to not only communicate um, professional content with healthcare professionals but also soft skills soft relationships yeah and this is how this is how uh, actually this is how salespeople know their customer better and we want to bring this skill to marketers as well not only marketers can build relationships better than before um, we provide o uh, online merge offline solutions for marketers to bring people from online to offline and even from offline to online for marketers to to convert for marketers to convert their clients to actual deals and besides marketers uh, medical people is also a very important uh, role in the whole process and um, for medical people they're able to bring their content from their HCB portal website which they have to log in and like spend lots of time to do it they can bring the content right into line which is the app that most healthcare professionals use on daily basis uh, on daily basis in Taiwan and for medical team, they're able to identify uh, the the identity identity of healthcare professionals from on online and browsers. So all the experience can be immersive. And the third one is for healthcare professionals. So as for salespeople, in the past, after a call, salespeople send emails to healthcare professionals afterwards. But right now. All you have to do is log into Okmega Social CRM. Then you can send your message directly through Line, which your clients can read it instantly and interact afterwards. And you don't have to you don't have to worry that hey, is this message sent on behalf uh, sent on behalf of the company? No. Even though you're in the same Line official account, your clients can see who's sending them the message. So your personal identity will also be shown. So as for salespeople, in the past, after a call with clients, you will send an email to them. But right now, all you have to do is log into Okmega Social CRM, then you can send the message directly through Line to increase the open rate and engagement rate with your clients. And not only you can send the message out, but you can also interact with them afterwards just like email, but way better than email because you have more formats to use. You have more interaction to build with. So let's move on to the third part, retain. After all the engagements, data came into social CRM. How do we analyze the data and retain your client? That is the key problem. So with the data you collected on, on Okmega Social CRM, you're able to compose your audience right away and target them and move your clients from tier three to tier two to tier one. And in the end, you may able to gain insights from your first party data. So last but not least, how do we grow your VIP customers in the future? For sales reps, you have digital name cards to expand your awareness within social platforms like Line, WhatsApp, Messenger, and Instagram. And for medical and marketing people, you have digital health education flyer to send the content to more people to gain awareness of the topic you want to talk about. So also loyalty program. We want to extend the customer lifetime value. So with loyalty program, uh, healthcare professionals can see how they improve, how they grow within your ecosystem. They will want to participate more uh, of your campaigns, your events, and learn more about your product. And this is how you build 
a better ecosystem. So we've talked about how to let marketers, sales, and medical team to acquire, engage, retain, and grow your VIP customers through social CRM. And this is the expected result. You can expect 99% enrollment rate within six months, which means you have all your customers on board to your platform. You can expect over 10 touch points per month per HCP, which means your clients engage with you more. You can expect over 50% monthly active user rate, which means more people want to interact with you. Your community is bigger. You can expect 100x growth within six months, which means you can expand your business even under difficult era like right now. Under COVID, we are facing lots of uncertainties. People are separated, families are broken. So Okmega developed social CRM. We want to bond everyone closer. We want to build relationships from offline to online and make the world a better place. Kojita 技術的通信和IT的技術 Intel is pleased to be here with the Institute for Biotechnology and Medicine Industry. And I am excited to be signing our MOU as part of the healthcare transformation journey. Hi everyone, my name is Sharon and also an uh, oral surgeon. And uh, now I'm this uh, panel discussion moderator. So this is Charles and this is Porsche. Hi, Sharon. I'm an emergency physician and I'm also very interested in digital health transformation. Uh, you can call me Charles. Thank you for having me. And hi, Charles. Uh, hi, Sharon. My name is Porsche. I'm the co founder of Okmega. We provide social CRM solutions for healthcare, uh, healthcare companies to build good relationships. Okay, thank you guys for giving us such a wonderful speech. So I believe everybody has some questions. So let me represent audience to ask you guys. So first, how has digital healthcare changed from the start of COVID-19? And I think the pandemic accelerates the digital transformation in healthcare particularly in telehealth. I've tried to start a company in 2018 doing telehealth service. Unfortunately, I failed. And the biggest challenge I faced, and many people question me, is that the accessibility of healthcare in Taiwan is very good, and the cost is not expensive. It's very convenient. What's the incentive for patient to use telehealth? 
to be honest, I didn't have very good answer in that time. But now I believe everyone knows, knows the answer. The only answer and the perfect answer is COVID. And I think pandemic pushes people to accept and try new tech to approach, like that, to approach their doctors. And there's no turning back. So I think the telehealth will be the biggest change after the pandemic. Okay, thank you for your story and your experience. So Charles, how will virtual care continue to evolve? Mm. Virtual care is a broad term. It means the, per the healthcare providers could interact with the patients remotely. So I think the telehealth will be the center of virtual care in the future. And the technology related to telehealth or could facilitate telehealth development will be the will be more important in the future about of the virtual care. Yes, I think that is a big change, no matter for the patients or the doctors. So another question is what are the biggest challenges to digital health adoption in clinical practice? Hmm. As a physician, I would say that there's, there's too much data. Mm -hmm. uh, too much data to remember, too much data to analyze, mm -hmm. and too much data to transform into useful insight. Those wearable devices were designed to give users early warning. But sometimes it became annoying and makes the users improperly worry about their health condition. So in clinical practice, we have to deal with those false alarms very carefully. And I think it's, uh, it's extra burden for the clinical practice. Thank you, Charles. And uh, I'm also curious about uh, social CRM. So, uh, Porsche, yep. how has social CRM <laughs> changed from the start of COVID-19? Okay, so just like Charles mentioned, uh, COVID changed how we behave, right? Mm -hmm. And we're staying at home more often instead of having actual activities offline. So, um, so from what per perspective, no matter if it's the relationship between a pharma medical device to healthcare professionals, or the relationships between healthcare professionals and their patients, um, everyone sort of need to bring the relationship, the touch points from offline to online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, if you want to uh, let, the, that, let the healthcare professionals know more about your product, know more about how can they help their patients. Um, in the past, you need a lot of salespeople, a, lo a, a huge sales force to, to um, deliver the knowledge, to deliver the message. But right now, if we can help the sales, uh, sales force people and have the information delivered through digital platforms and then have other activities offline and it can make the whole process way more efficient. Yeah. And um, from, from what we see in, in the market is that people, goes to, uh, people go to clinics mm -hmm. more instead of go to the first, the biggest hospitals. Mm -hmm. So um, in the past, there, no, there, there, were, there weren't that much resources to build a relationship with doctors at clinics or the patients that uh, visit clinics. Mm -hmm. And right now through social CRM, uh, we believe that all the problems can be solved. Yeah, and uh, so uh, what do you think about uh, how will digital transformation continue to evolve in the future? Okay, so um, we're bringing some activities, right, and relationships from offline to off uh, to online. Mm -hmm. And I think the criti cr critical critical point is that how do we build a good relationships mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. right? Um, right now, I, I suppose you both. Um, has has Facebook. Yes. And definitely you will see lots of ads, mm -hmm. one-way communication. You get lots of um, unnecessary uh, information through the through, through digital platforms. But when we're talking about building good relationships and especially very important information about, uh, about your health, I think it is, I think the future is we have to learn how to build good relationships like we have right now from yes. offline to online. online. Yeah, and that is something uh, everyone has to has to learn, because because 
when we're behind a screen, mm -hmm. you usually think, hey, I just sent a message out and that's done. I'm, uh, my job is done. But actually, you're dealing with real human on mm -hmm. the other side. So the mindset is, I think, is something that everyone needs to learn in the near future. That's so insightful. Yeah, thanks for poor sharing. And you've mentioned you have to keep a good relationship online, right? Yeah. Yep. But somehow, I just, just like I, I've mentioned before, the user experience of telehealth in Taiwan now is fragmented. The user experience is not so good. Mm -hmm. You have to download three different apps, and one for payment, one for employment, and one for virtual meetings. So I just wonder if there's any unified platform or unified product to provide a better user experience mm -hmm. yeah, to, to do in telehealth in Taiwan. Yeah, so um, in terms of digital transformation, having your data in one single place is important. Yeah. And since we have a, such a long customer journey, right? Yeah. Um, patient journey, I mean, you need to acquire patient and you need to engage with them, know your patient and yeah. do diagnosis, do your treatment mm -hmm. and have them come back to, to, to your place cool. yeah. and do it again. And you have multiple people talking to the patient. You have yourself, mm -hmm. right? And your colleagues. Uh, yeah, nurse. So, yeah, so um, uh, that is what actually that is what social CRM is working on. Mm. We want to help um, everyone in this ecosystem able to interact and have the data created and put it into one single platform. So no, and so in mat in the future, no matter if it is that you want to um, review your performance or you want to make new strategy, mm. all the data is there and you can utilize them. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I think social CIM's experience, yeah, could be trans transformed, or you could take that to healthcare. Yeah, it's sure. uh, So besides, like, so besides um, integrating all the platforms, what do you think is the most important uh, thing to do to in, to improve the user experience in um, your career, like your work? Um, it depends on what kind of user you want to you want to approach. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think this the it's the whole process could be smooth. Mm -hmm. And but for patient, I think and the com the conveniency is the most important part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they could um, make an appointment or see the doctors and and finish the payment in one product. That would be a very convenient way for the patient mm -hmm. to use telehealth. And it lowered the threshold for patients to adopt this new technology. Yeah, it, for me, some patients are old age patient, right? Mm -hmm. And they have difficulty to use those new technology. Mm -hmm. So I think the user interface and user experience is very important to push them to use the new technology to approach them doctors agree <laughs> okay so uh, we are a pleasure to have these two guys to share their insight so thank you
I'm Beverly Chan, and I have eight years of experience in medical devices development and digital health technologies. I am now the assistant professor at Zhongyuan University, and I lead a lab in digital health technologies. In today's topic, I will touch base on the next wave of digital health, digital therapeutics. All right, hi, I'm Beverly Chen, and today I would like to talk on the topic of the next wave of digital health, digital therapeutics. First off, I will start from the technology's perspective, how it has massively changed our daily life compared to a decade ago. And I have summarized it right here. Our daily life is uniquely characterized with digital footprints from mobile devices that we carry and use every day from the online shopping sites that we shop on and they use those shopping habits that we have to recommend similar products that we could possibly purchase. From social media platforms where we can uh, share our photos and our personal stories. From entertainment platforms like Netflix and Disney Plus, they could use our view history to recommend us what is our next favorite movie or drama. And lastly, we're adopting more smart home devices into our home and our daily life, like Google Homes or Amazon's Alexias. And the digital footprints that we left behind using these devices and platforms help us to understand more about our daily life, our habits, our lifestyles. And from these data, we could possibly to understand more about our health conditions. And this is really driving and accelerates the evolutions of digital health. So why is digital health the next wave of health? Apart from being driven forward by the COVID-19 pandemic, people are actually realizing that the health need is way beyond the hospitals. For example, when patients is finishes treatments and being discharged from the hospital, the patients needs to rehab at home. Or even way before the patients get ill, how do we prevent diseases? How do we achieve early diagnosis? As I mentioned in the previous slides, we could leverage on the digital footprint. And this is what digital health is doing. Digital health includes technologies, platforms, and systems that engage consumers for lifestyle, wellness, and health-related purposes. So what are the technologies in digital health and to enable patients to receive care outside of the traditional clinical setting? First of all is the wearable sensors, which a lot of people have known is to help, could help to record patients' activities, biomarkers such as oxygen saturations, the smartphone cameras to capture health images such as the skin lesions to enable uh, remote patient examinations via telemedicine. As I mentioned before, the in-home connected virtual assistants like Google Homes, they could provide health information, but also they could uh, record our habits and provide notifications. Telemedicine, a lot of people have known that uh, it could provide the care uh, virtually uh, from the healthcare professionals. The personal health records, by making it online, it facilitates the continuity of care. And I think we are really lucky that we have this system right here in Taiwan. The care team text messages allows the healthcare professional to proactively communicate with the patients at home. Consumer mobile apps, I will talk about, about it more later on, but it, but it helps to provide the uh, healthcare services beyond the traditional clinical settings. And lastly is our topic of today, digital therapeutics, and I'll talk about it more later on. So digital health compares to the traditional healthcare, it is a Netflix approach. It increases the, the access of the patients uh, to get care where and when they need it. For example, if, we want, if you want to get an ultrasound scan, normally we will need to go to 
uh, the hospitals or a clinic or a clinics to get the scans from this big and bulky machines that are shown on the left hand pictures. But Butterfly is a company. They developed a handheld ultrasound device, which can be plugged into any mobile device to perform the ultrasound scans anywhere on anyone. Although the uh, resolutions of the ultrasound scan is not as good as the traditional machine, but the, with the machine learning software backbones, it compensates the hardware capability. So digital health has also transformed the traditional health care through the Uberization mechanisms. For example, the patients with a wearable device, they will give a notifications when their health is deviating from normal. Doctors no longer need to do the checkup in the clinical settings. It can be done in the Uber ride. Family and friends can join medical consultations via Zoom meetings to support and motivates the patients. And all in all, that the patient expectations and involvements are changing to value-based care. Now I like to talk about digital therapeutics. But, but before that, I would like to ask you a question. If I said treatments, what are the possible treatments that you could think of that the doctor can prescribe to you? I think these are the four treatment methods that you could think of. The doctors could prescribe you the drug, could ask you to do surgeries, to ask you to get bio implants or medical devices. But have you ever thought about that the phone or the mobile devices that you carry every day can actually perform treatments on your health condition as well? And more specifically, are the apps in, sitting in your phone that can perform treatments on your health conditions. And th this is not a lousy app that I'm talking about. These are real stories in the US. Livongo is the company, is an IPO company in the US. They combine the glucose monitoring devices with the app to help diabetes patients to manage their glucose levels. Omada has the app on the left-hand side to help obesity patients to manage their weight. Propeller combines the digital app with the inhalers to help the asthma patients. And here is another classic example from digital therapeutics. They use video games to treat ADHD children, to help them to stay focused. And this video game is being FDA approved. This actually transformed our traditional thinkings because that we thought that video game is bad for kids, but with careful designed and clinical trials that the video game could become a digital treatment. Now we look at digital therapeutics from the definition's point of view. Uh, digital health is actually a, a broad uh, term that uh, includes digital medicines, telemedicine, remote monitoring and digital therapeutics is part of the digital medicines and is also under the umbrella terms of the digital health. Digital therapeutics is actually an evidence-based, software-driven, therapeutic-driven interventions to treat, manage, or prevent disease. So there are two large areas where digital therapeutics that focuses on are the chronic diseases and behavioral health. And this is because there is a massive market for, uh, that's well suited for the digital therapeutics paradigms. And secondly, behavior change is very hard. So that digital therapeutics can be used to manage chronic disease by promoting the treatment compliance and behavioral modifications. We might think that digital therapeutics is just only an app that's sitting in our mobile phone, but it's actually more than that. It is the whole programs. It includes the education materials, the coach help, monitoring devices, and software notifications to educate and manage conditions and treating it in order to improve clinical outcomes and reduce healthcare costs. So in, if I summarize what is digital therapeutics, it is actually providing personalized health outside of the clinical settings 
by collecting a lot of our data in our daily life to change our behavior. And by having the mobile phone with us all the times, it can deploy the right interventions at the right time for the right patients. Now, lastly, I would like to talk about digital health development and why Taiwan is a great place for it. First, Taiwan has the world-class ICT industries. If I mention Acer or ASUS, you probably immediately will pop up with their products like laptops, computer screens, tablets, or even mobile devices. So these ICT companies leverage their hardware development capabilities combining with the software system integrations. It really helped them to speed up the digital health technology developments. And here are some of their examples that the ICT companies entering into the digital health sectors and their products. Twenty Twenty One Medical Taiwan, the whole new Medical Taiwan hybrid, comes across as both physical and virtual forms, a combination of offline and online, breaking through limits in time and space. 在我身旁的呢是每年度组团参展的一材工会。那我们今天想要请问一下工会的理事长，在品牌与通路的那个行销，我们透过医疗展的平台，部分产业将有效的那个整合。以增强我们那个推广力道，也对有利于提升台湾的量度与能见度。二零一四年医疗器材出口金额为七百四十三亿元，那二零一九医疗器材出口金额已达到一千零四十亿元，成长了二十九趴。这都是工会多年组团参加医疗展得来的成果。Another highlight of 2021 Medical Taiwan is this is Medical Taiwan's first joint exhibition with Taiwan Beauty, showcasing beauty and skincare products, skin repair products, raw materials, packaged materials, and so on, such as the Marura oil from Swatini, tea tree oil, and other body care products. In addition, it features innovative ingredient development, cross-industry new tech, and green packaging. The Taiwan Beauty Valley Pavilion presents the latest technology and products, and organizes the seminar. Taiwan connects the world with beauty. 主积极伺服器大厂 Super Micro 美超维公司也在进入医疗领域后，首次在台参与医疗产业 B to B 商展。那我们现在呢，就来采访一下现场的资深业务开发经理凯。呃，我们在很多年前就已经进入到这个医疗产业了。那今年第一次参加医疗展，其实。现在因为 IOT 的浪潮，很多的这个领域往这个垂直产业去深根。那我们也希望透过这样的一个次曝光呢，能够加深我们的这个使用族群在 Super Micro 智慧医疗的这个呃知名度。那过往在这个远端医疗可能只能做一个简单的问诊的部分。那因为现在的这个5 G 的技术的发展，那它的频宽会比较大。那这个医疗手术是非常及时的哦。我们为了要挽救病患生意，必须要。Medical Taiwan allows domestic and foreign manufacturers and buyers to expand business opportunities. It's an essential professional exhibition and exchange platform for finding business partners. In response to the pandemic, this year, in addition to the physical exhibition, online virtual exhibition and online sourcing meeting are also available, which allow exhibitors to explore overseas business opportunities. And demonstrate the advantages of Taiwan products through online interactive communication. We this year have eight medical device related team members participating. That field covers medical diagnosis, and some data analysis. Of course, the goal of the exhibition is to allow the team to have a direct collaboration opportunity, and to even invest in medical devices. We also hope. 透过这样的，不管是线上线下的活动，可以来达到，所以我们觉得这样的一个活动是对于这些新创团队是非常有帮助，可以串联到不同的产业的资源。Medical Taiwan, see you in 2022. Hi, I'm Xiao Wei Chang. 
I'm currently CEO of Sume Taiwan. Sume Taiwan invests and incubates Maxima Biotech by making and receiving TFDA approval of the world's second cordless ultrasonic dissector. Hello, I'm Xiao Wei Chang. I'm currently CEO of Sume Taiwan. Sume Taiwan is a medical device incubator. Our strength is uh, talent building, angel investment, and go to Taiwan market. I was trained as a mechanical engineer and have broad career experiences in medical robotics and medical device R&D, product commercialization, and business development. Before Sume Taiwan, I worked for Taiwanese government to do national inventory check and gap analysis for medical device innovation. First of all, I want, I want to raise a question. What is the purpose of innovation? My answer is to make our world better. In order to make our world better, we solve problems for humanity. Therefore, we must commercialize a service or product and make money to support the ecosystem. Why? Without money, no services will be delivered and no product will be made and no people will benefit from the innovation. In short, innovation equals to making money equals to better world for everybody, especially for ourselves. Here is a good example I would like to elaborate. In 2018, Tarumo acquired Medium Biodesign's vascular closure device. The device is intended for use in case lab following cardiac and peripheral procedures. It is a large ball interventional device compared with traditional 5 to 8 French devices. The function of closed seal is to close the puncture side in the artery wall. To me, it is like a sewing machine made by plastic and metal that worth 20 million US dollars. By the way, I'm the principal engineer who invented this device. I started to work in 20, 2012, and it is until 2016 we have the first uh, successful first in human. The total deal is 50 million US dollars, including FDA approval and second generation. Another example of innovation equals to making money equals to better world. In medical device innovation, Covidian acquired new wave surgical in 2014. This is a hot bottle or thermos that worth 100 million US dollars. What it does is to keep the lenses defect by heated liquid in the bottle and an additional cotton swab to clean the trocar. The company is founded in 2003 and raised only 3 million US dollars to make the product and go to market. In 2014, it has estimated to make a 21 million revenue with 70% profit margin, and it has 145 employees and end up being merged by Covidian with a 100 million US dollar. What a good example of innovation to make money to make the world better. From those and many other medical device innovation examples, there is no high tech. The value comes from the problems they solved, not the technology they applied. If this is so simple why so many startups fail, what are the pitfalls? Medical device is a high mix, low volume production with comprehensive quality system. There are many requirements, but complicated and fragmented. We need technicians with craftsmanship. We need technology cluster with supply chain. We need freedom to operate and patent portfolio. And the most critical part is we need to build a safe and effective product while compiling the documents for regulatory approval simultaneously. But the market opportunity has limited time window. In order to seize the opportunity, Sume Taiwan assembled a seasoned team specialized in medical device innovation to help medical device startup to build good quality and good price product by leveraging Taiwan technology cluster and supply chain to accelerate product development. To incubate the startup, Sume Taiwan provides resources and talents on demand, which means money and know-how by angel fund and expert modules. 
we invest in startup companies and guide them to fulfill the three curriculum. Make a product, sell it to a market, and build your team. So the size of our angel fund is 8.5 million US dollar and we have more than 100 experts to provide services and con consultancy to our companies based on their needs. This is a roadmap that shows the comprehensive support from expert modules to a sumo company during medical device life cycle. The goal is not only to make a product but to make a sustainable, sustainable business. Our portfolio includes Maxima Biotech, focusing at minimal invasive surgical instruments. QMS Catheter Medical provides CDMO solution from catheter machines to key components. Taiwan Yichen is working on digitizing Chinese medicine. HCT Regenerative specializes in tissue processing to create regenerative biomaterials for clinical use. Jiacheng Global Dental is focusing at providing digital solution to dental clinics and Coatsmed is a local distributor for surgical supplies. So Maxima Biotech demonstrates the progress of incubation by provided by Sumet Taiwan by making a product and receiving the TFDA clearance of the world second cordylis ultrasonic dissector within three years. This is another investment from Sumet in building a world-class contract development and manufacturing organization site. And this shows our strengths in go to Taiwan market, both in strategy and administrative process. These three examples shows our investment in R&D production and distribution and its synergy to maximize the successful rate. In conclusion, medical device industry is facing a critical need from political economical, social, and technological inferences. We all agree that aging society, COVID-19, and national conflicts will change our world. But I believe a better world with good quality and good price medical device can be achieved by Taiwan. So why zoom it? We have know-how and established capacities in R&D, production, and distribution. Our technology focus at instruments, catheters, biomaterials, and optics. We have a talent pool in medical device life cycle, and Taiwan's electronic manufacturing services and the supply chain cluster will deliver good quality and good cost in small volume, large variety production. The fundamental of medical device innovation is to make the world better. Thus, a sustainable business is the key to deliver its benefits. With Taiwan's help, we can make good quality product to deliver the innovation and good price product to penetrate to bigger population. Thus, let's make medical device industry in Taiwan to help the world. Thank you. Taiwan找到它的角色跟地位
Hello everyone, my name is Bill Tsai. I'm currently the Bio Fund Investment Analyst on Taiwanian Capital. As we all know that COVID-19 pandemics has dramatically changed the way we live, that we have to wear a mask everywhere we go. Even when we're in the gym doing heavy weight lifting, we have to still have to wear a mask, that's just crazy. And God knows how bad we miss traveling. And in healthcare industry, there's no exception. Pandemics also significantly alter the status quo of the healthcare system. The virtual health and care delivered in home become not only necessity, but also preference. But this change was not as instant as it might look. The pandemic is just an accelerator that has accelerated most of the trends for now, including shifting consumer preference, rapidly evolving technologies, new business model, and clinical innovations. So in the face of these trends, as hospital and health systems work toward adapting these uh, businesses, a well-defined approach toward digital technology will likely to be at the core of this transformation strategy. So this is why today we're having this panel. We have two outstanding experts joining us, our panelists today, and we got, we got to discuss among this digital transformation in healthcare, what is happening now and what's next. So uh, the first panelist we have today is Dr. Tan. Uh, she's currently the CEO of Summit Innovation Platform. For the people who doesn't know about SubMed, it is a medtech venture composed of a lot of entrepreneurial experts in innovations, many finding, manufacturing, and patterns mapping, and so on and so forth. So in general, SubMed is a venture that takes a hands-on approach to invest and grow their portfolio towards successful exit. So Dr. Tang himself also have a lot of successful innovations. Uh, the most famous one is the one he, the, the product he built when he was in Medion uh, Bell Design. The product he built sold for $50 million to Terumo. So it is great to have this genius engineer and also a very insightful venture capitalist having uh, joined our meeting today. And the other panelist, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, is currently assistant professor at Zhongyuan Christian University in medical engineering. And she was a visiting scholar at Stanford University for more than a year ago and a fellow in Life Science Angel Angels. The Life, Sci Life Science Angels, it is a nonprofit corporation with hundreds of accredited venture members. And Dr. Chen's research focused on smart medical device, AI and deep learning applications in healthcare. So it is also a great privilege to have Dr. Chen join our meeting today as a professional who apparently knows almost all the fields like in engineering and medicine and also in finance, apparently. Okay, the topic we're discussing today is the healthcare stakeholders most approach digital transformation. And we prepared several questions to kind of discuss with two panelists. So the first one coming up is how is the healthcare business change from the start of COVID-19. I'm going to start from Dr. Chen. Uh, you know, after, after, we, after the pandemic started, what do you see as the major or change in healthcare technology or healthcare industry in general? All right, thank you for that question. I can tell you a story um, from when I was in, at Stanford University. And the professor actually asked the whole entire class, about 40 to 50 students, uh, if there is a telemedicine app, would you use it? Uh -huh. And guess what? How many students raised their hand? Actually, only about four or five oh. students raised their hand. And the reason is that they're young people. They're around 30, 30, 20 years old students. And they are very skeptical about using these apps, telemedicines. And the reason why is they don't really know who is actually behind the screen, is actually a real doctor or not. And if they're examining my wound, for example, are they really seeing the right things? And are, are they really making the right judgments? So they're really being very, very skeptical. But guess what happens after COVID-19? The really drives the, uh, the adoptions of the digital health apps. And um, the, in terms of the skepticism and the awareness, uh, it basically erased all of them. So wow. now, uh, actually, after the COVID-19 has started, 
I was using one of the, the telemedicine app to actually consult with one of my doctors in the US. Wow, me, me too, actually. <laughs> so I think yeah, Dr. Chen raised a very important one is, uh, no matter how tech savvy the person is, before the COVID, they also, they're still scared of uh, digital transformation or digital therapeutics in general. But when the COVID outbreaks, it just accelerates people's mindset. So that's what I said before, did this become a necessity, not only a necessity, but also a preference for people to yeah. want to use this digital transformation. And for Dr. Tong, do you have any observation after the COVID outbreak? Uh, in my point of view, that uh, digital transformation is a trend that we must adapt. Uh, but uh, from innovation, where we must make money uh, with limited time and resources, we must consider uh, is there a market need and uh, how do you uh, obtain that, uh, that market need with your team and uh, limited resources. So uh, back to the, uh, what we uh, see as a healthcare. Healthcare has two goals. The first goal is uh, the clinical outcome and the second goal is the cost control. So uh, in my point of view, digital transformation can uh, uh, address on the cost control uh, that we can minimize the uh, burdens and also the distances, especially in United States, that it's not like in Taiwan, we can uh, just walk in any clinics, yeah. even uh, 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 medical centers uh, with uh, my walking. But in United States, I think that's a, 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 a very uh, important need. Yes. And uh, COVID-19, I think, drives the, drive this uh, demand uh, or accelerates this demand. So if we can uh, uh, focus in on huh, finding the right on many needs and uh, uh, put our efforts with limited time and uh, uh, money, maybe we can uh, generate a lot of uh, uh, ventures and also uh, good startups that uh, 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 I think, yeah, in my point of view, making money is the goal of innovation. So that's what we can uh, leverage the opportunities that comes uh, every time. I think COVID-19 is just one of the events in our life. There will be yeah. more in yeah. my point of view. Yeah. I think, yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Song, to bringing the, the very important mindset we should have is when we're building a new medical technology, we must consider clinical outcome as one important parameter, and the other one is the cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And apparently that digital uh, transformation mm -hmm. can make the cost effectiveness very good, mm -hmm. but for the outcome, it feels like it's yet to, yet to prove that we still have a lot of work to do about mm -hmm. this. And that is why a lot of digital, I think, um, therapeutics company are still uh, suffering to prove their their clinical, you know, the, the, the outcome in general. So and and yeah, and also I think Dr. Tong also raised a very important uh, question is uh, when we're in US, uh, the different medical centers or clinics are pretty far away from each other. So this makes this digital transformation uh, relatively easy to adopt in US. Mm -hmm. But in Taiwan or in most of the country in Asia, it is very condensed. Mm -hmm. Like um, we, we may not de need the digital transformation our digital products that much. So yeah, so the follow-on question I have with this is, what is the biggest challenge you see in this kind of uh, digital products adaption in Taiwan or in Asia in general? I think, uh, can Dr. Tong you uh, answer this one first? Uh, okay, let me uh, elaborate it. Uh, in one of my uh, sessions with uh, my uh, mentor, Professor Peter Fitzgerald, uh, he mentioned about two things. That is uh, also uh, back to the, the goal of healthcare is operational efficiency and also clinical impact. So uh, if we can achieve this uh, operational efficiency, then there must be value created. Uh, then it's just uh, if you can build a business model, business model uh, on top of it to capture the value then you will be success. So uh, because it's a service model, so uh, I think the biggest gap in my point of view is that uh, we are not in the same culture in Taiwan and in the US. 
because uh, business is uh, market oriented, you must address to the market needs. So the insight of the market is uh, critical, or that's the that's uh, where you put resources and you assign your money in. So uh, if you want to uh, solve this uh, operational efficiency problem, uh, then I will suggest to go to Silicon Valley or go to uh, United States where uh, you can have the right people and the right money to incubate your team. But if you are in Taiwan, you want to address this kind of needs. I think Taiwan's strength is the uh, hardware and also uh, our uh, people. We are smart and uh, also very working very hard. Uh, so uh, that's something that we call it a uh, division of labor. So uh, two years ago, I go to Stanford and Berkeley and uh, uh, I called a meeting, which is a mini club, where I want to uh, build a model is that if we can uh, have the unmanned needs identified in the United States uh, with the right specification, I think Taiwan's team, Taiwanese team is the, is the best team that can accelerate and also make it, make it uh, quick to uh, attend this uh, business, uh, business opportunity. But uh, because uh, that is only one event and then uh, we all stuck in uh, Taiwan. So uh, <laughs> I think uh, we, can, we still have the opportunity. Let's uh, wait and see. Yeah, I'm very, very agree with uh, Dr. Tan's comments because what I saw is also uh, Taiwan is a very great place for proof of concept of this kind of digital health products and their market is not, not, cannot be only in Taiwan. Taiwan is a bit too small for this. Um, it may not be the best place to sell the product and US will be the best. So uh, as, Dr. Tan, as Dr. Tan suggests, if we can try to find out many in US and quickly adapt and accelerate the product development in Taiwan, and then we bring it back to the market where we're gonna sell in the US, I think that will be a very uh, good solution to solve the challenges we have for now. And for Dr. Chen, you, you have any comments about uh, the, current, the current challenge we face when we are uh, adapting this kind of digital transformation, especially in healthcare industry, what are the challenges? Yeah, all right, so if, if you're talking about uh, in Taiwan, then you look from the Taiwan's healthcare systems, uh, but what's happening right now in the Taiwan's healthcare system is um, a lot of, because it needs data, right? Yeah. If you need <laughs> digital health, you really need a lot of data, you need health data. And where's the health data? It's in the hospital, right? But then in Taiwan, the health, the hospitals in Taiwan is not very consolidated. Therefore, each of their each of the hospitals have their own database. Yes. And in terms of that, it's really hard to um, do a kind of a, a large analysis on those data. And how they in terms of how they process those data probably is different from each um, hospital. Yeah. So I think that's the difficult where the difficulty lies. Um, and I, I really think that it really needs a good cons consolidation, a platform maybe, of where all the data could be uploaded onto that platforms, and everyone have the access of those data as well. So I think that's the challenge that you probably will see in, in Taiwan. But uh, in terms of the uh, and challenges overall in digital therapeutics is what um, you guys have mentioned actually is the evidence. You need yeah. to do cl clinical trials to show that these apps were combining these apps with wearable devices that actually have a therapeutic effect. And you really need to prove it uh, for people to, for adoptions. And you need to go through the FDA approval. Now is all under the software as medical devices regulations. FDA is really working on the pre-search to accelerate that entire process. But for now, it's all under the software as medical devices. So you need to prove it to the FDA to get approval in order for you to convince your buyers to buy it. So I think it come back to, still come back to the adoptions and what are your business models in terms of this entire process. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think Dr. Chen also raised a 
raise a question that kind of contradict to most of the people's think because what we heard is Taiwan have the very very good health insurance uh, I think for for customer side mm -hmm. and the data they collect is very comprehensive mm -hmm. but so when we thought that if uh, these kind with this kind of data we can generate tons of uh, great fantastic digital health product but as Dr. Chen told um, there's, a, there's a problem about this that uh, the data is not integrated enough mm -hmm. for, for people to use old data mm -hmm. and also the access is a question it's a problem for most of the engineers or entrepreneurs when they're trying to develop these kind of product mm -hmm. so yeah I think that is a, that is a challenge definitely for, for mm -hmm. us to solve like in the, in the right corner mm -hmm. in the near corner Oh yeah, so we have uh, three more questions to follow with the panelists. So uh, the, the next question I have is for Dr. Tong, you are currently the venture capitalist in some adventure. And I wonder uh, for you standing as a VC, uh, what is the value add that, that, that you can bring to your portfolio company to help them grow and success in this digital transformation like in healthcare recently? Okay. Uh... Taiwan eChain is a company that we invested, I think, uh, last year. Mm -hmm. uh, what it does is uh, to digitize the, the, the information of your post. Uh, it's in Chinese medicine. So uh, in traditional uh, Chinese medicine, actually it relies on uh, surgeons uh, or physicians' uh, skill to feel and to watch. So uh, Dr. Guo, he... Uh, I think he accumulated uh, 20 years of uh, data and then uh, he built a, 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 how to say it, a knowledge base or he built a database that can uh, distinguish uh, the post and uh, refer to the status of your health condition. So uh, I think what we help is that we uh, tell them that if you use that in your clinics, then only the patients of your clinics can benefit from it. But if you bring it as a, a startup company and uh, use this kind of uh, uh, silicon model to uh, expand that, then uh, these uh, good things, in my point of view, can benefit uh, all of us. So uh, I think we are the first uh, outside investors of uh, his company. And then following our investment, actually uh, the Terry Go from Foxconn and also uh, Steve Chen of YouTube are also in the invest investors uh, list. So I think with the people uh, with money, their intention can drive this uh, idea. The assumption is that uh, this uh, data can uh, benefit the people's health, health then uh, they will find a lot of uh, business models based on this uh, data he accumulated. So this is uh, the Sume example. But uh, the investment uh, for us is the long term. It takes maybe 10 or 20 years. So we cannot put uh, a large portion of our uh, money in that. But for us, it's a uh, kind of, uh, uh, this, uh, so our portfolio uh, has this, uh, this uh, allocation. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think yeah, Dr. Tong uh, mentioned a very, very good uh, example for the value add that VC can bring to the company. I think the first one is the mindset uh, as you, as a very experienced entrepreneur before, you can talk the, 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 um, the company, the, the startups, to, to tell them that how, how they can grow, how can they scale up, how yep. can they have a bigger vision about the, the product they can bring to the world. And also the other part is the financial part that we are, you know, I think Summit is not only a, a only investor you know, in their own circle, they have a very good connection with other VCs. So this is how when Summit Venture put in, there are a lot of, they can syndicate a lot of other funds and that can make the company you know, grow much more faster and accelerate their product development. And, boys. and yes, for the next, uh, next, product, uh, next question I have, I think um, I want to ask uh, Dr. Chen, uh, what do you see um, the virtual care continue to evolve that, what do, you what do you see the next stage of the virtual care will be you know, in, in the future? 
All right. Uh, in terms of virtual care, uh, I think it will combine with wearable devices, and then it will bring health care outside of our traditional clinical settings into our home. So it become a home-based health care. And not, you actually see uh, in the US, there are a lot of examples, a lot of big companies, not only the IT companies, um, companies from the entertainment, companies like Nike, they wear our, they, they make our clothes. Mm -hmm. They're all interested in digital health. And why is that? That's because these clothes are the things that we wear every day. Okay. Oh, model ma, sorry. Zhang Yu. Zhang Yu is what? Oh, Yifu. Okay. Ha. Uh, company like Nike, uh, they make our clothes, clothing, uh, shoes. They're interested in healthcare as well because they can embed uh, sensors oh, yes. into our clothes, clothes and monitor our health conditions or physio physiological signals. Um, entertainment, they're in our home as well. Um, and using entertainment, how they motivate, like for example, Hollywood, they make movie that they motivate us, they touch our hearts, and they could also use entertainment like drama to motivate people who cannot change their behavior to change their behavior. And by changing their behavior and their lifestyle, they are actually improving their health, care, their health condition as well. So you, can, you will actually see that um, probably in the future, the virtual care will consolidate with these medical devices companies and all these big companies like IT companies, Google, Amazon, uh, Nike, they will come in, entertainment, they will come in and then trying to make this a well-connected a, a network, a healthcare network outside of hospitals. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think Dr. Chen brings up a very interesting part is uh, the telehealth uh, product, I, I, I would say first of all, uh, uh, what Dr. Chen mentioned is telemedicine is not going to focus on medicine, it's going to become a telehealth that can bring, that can help the people in the home care. And also the player inside this telehealth industry will not only be uh, healthcare startups or not only be healthcare systems, mm -hmm. a lot of other players like uh, clothes uh, manufacturers mm -hmm. and also some entertainment hardware uh, development product were joining this uh, this party too. Yeah. And yeah, I think that is very, that definitely will, I definitely see that coming in the future. Right. So I'll also mention another thing is um, now they will actually not focus on when patient is ill, they will actually focus on way before they get ill. So they're looking into uh, preventions yes. or wellness, or that, that's just one area. Well, what happens when you, when you leave the hospitals in the rehab stage? Yeah. So it's the entire uh, health span, the entire, your entire life, basically. Mm -hmm. I think that is definitely uh, what digital health product can, can help it out because mm -hmm. when people, you, you know, traditionally, people can only check their disease in hospital. And when they're outside hospital, doctors cannot touch, cannot mm -hmm. evaluate how patient is well or not. Mm -hmm. And with the digital health uh, power, we can, have, we can have this kind of data and monitor patient's health condition. Right. And yeah, I think we're coming to the end of this uh, panel discussion. So the one last question I have for uh, both uh, panelists is, what are the, uh, the emerging trends that you see in digital health? That what is coming? What is coming um, instead of what we just talked about? And uh, for Dr. Tong, can you mention, I can answer this question first? Uh, I think there is a key word, which is uh, metaverse. So uh, in our generation, in my generation, actually we like the temperature of uh, people interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the younger generation, actually they uh, grow up with uh, these uh, computers, uh, virtual worlds. So uh, I think healthcare is the eternal goal of human. So uh, if you keep on investing in that uh, field, actually, I would think that will happen. And uh, uh, my mentor told me that if you see there is an industry in 20 years, what you do is uh, uh, make a line and then segment it, it achieving every milestones. And then in 20 years, you will become somebody in that industry. Thank you.
Wow, wow. <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see this coming. I think Metaverse is definitely a, a trend that's coming up. And I think, uh, I think at first, only maybe a younger generation know about this. And now it's like old generation are talking about Metaverse. And I, I think it's still growing. And it is definitely will expand this uh, its field into healthcare field as well. Yeah, and for Dr. Chen, do you see, um, what, what do you think is the emerging trend in healthcare, uh, health, digital health in general? All right, so apart from um, enabling healthcare into home care, mm -hmm. uh, you will actually see that a lot of things that go virtual, not, not only um, these uh, monitorings or treatments, in terms of the things that happens in, probably in the hospital as well, so you can imagine that there could be, in the future, there will be a virtual hospital, which um, you can imagine that the doctor can be in Taiwan, but performing a surgery in Indonesia. Yeah. Right? So uh, you will see things um, through internet, healthcare being delivered probably through internet. Uh, I think so that, that's probably the next trend that we, we might see. Um, and that really transform our transitional thinking. Yeah, yeah, I think that is pretty, it's very similar as the metaverse, uh, the metaverse world, right? So I guess, yeah, uh, we'll see, we'll see what metaverse can do uh, as we discuss about digital health. Yeah, I think, I think uh, that is the, the point that we can wrap up this uh, panel, uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for your participation and all your very uh, well experienced uh, sharing with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.